Thank you, Susan, for those uh, really kind words and strong support for our uh, community. It's my pleasure uh, and honor to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Reginald DeRoche, president of Rice University. Dr. Re uh, DeRoche is a preeminent scholar in civil engineering, having received the Presidential Early Career Award in 2002, and is the recipient of several notable research prizes distinguished lectures at universities and keynote speeches at conferences internationally. He's published more than 300 research articles on topics including the design of resilient infrastructure and the application of SMART and auto-adaptive materials. He was elected member of the National Academy in 2020. The impact of Dr. DeRoche's work goes well beyond basic research. As a fellow of the American Society of Civil Engineers, Dr. DeRoche served as a key technical leader for the United States' response to the 2010 Haiti earthquake. He led a large team of engineers, architects, city planners, and social scientists to the area to understand the disaster and the impacts of, dis of earthquakes. He's, since then, he's participated in numerous congressional briefings, has testified before the House and Senate to underscore the critical role that university research can play in addressing our country's infrastructure needs and enhancing our nation's resilience. He's also been a champion of workforce development, including the challenges and opportunities for underrepresented groups in STEM fields. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. DeRoche. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, I want to thank NSF for their uh, continued support. Thank, thank Mary for uh, inviting me to be here. It's, it's truly an honor to be here. Uh, as a university president, I don't get to spend much time with what I consider my people, people who work in this area. Not that my university people aren't my people, but um, <laughs> it's just great to be around people I've, I've spent the last 25, 30 years uh, with and to see all of you and, and some of the great work that you're doing and important work that you're doing. Um, my comments, uh, my brief comments today come from the perspective of somebody who studied uh, natural hazards for the past 25 years, um, uh, somebody who's taken, a, a, who's had a different look and different perspective on natural hazards, um, uh, spending more time at a broader university and looking at the, the humanistic aspect of natural hazards. And most importantly, from a person who's spent the last five years in a place that has been directly impacted by, by natural hazards. Uh, and so that's, that's sort of the perspective from which uh, my brief comments will come from. All right, so I'll, I'm going to uh, divide my comments into three, three parts, talk about the challenge that we face. And I think um, it's preaching to the choir in many cases, because as many of you are in, at, at the front lines of this challenge. Uh, talk about the opportunity that I see for us to, to begin to have an impact, continue to have an impact and make a difference, and then uh, uh, a call to action on perhaps how we can galvanize the community to, to really begin making uh, some inroads in this, in this challenge. So I was, as was mentioned earlier, uh, we're coming off the heels of uh, devastating uh, Hurricane Ian, which impacted uh, most of Florida and certainly South Carolina and North Carolina and other parts of the U.S. and, and we're still trying to fully understand the impacts of, of this devastating uh, event which will go down as one of the, certainly the worst in recent history with hundreds of lives lost and, and significant impact to, to many communities in this area. More recently, also recently in summer of 2022, we saw a dramatic flooding imp event that occurred in Pakistan that impacted over four million people. It's hard to comprehend that, but four million people were impacted uh, by this flooding event with, uh, with one third of the country underwater. Uh, in some places, the water still hasn't fully receded. Uh, large casualty event, many, many people displaced, a really devastating event for uh, the infrastructure and the people of this region. And then Hurricane Harvey, which was uh, uh, very impactful for me. I moved to Houston in um, uh, late summer of, of 17, just before Hurricane Harvey hit, uh, and was there uh, just a few weeks when 60 inches of rain poured over uh, just four days in this region. That is actually me, uh, standing outside of my apartment uh, the morning, I think it was Sunday morning after 
we received something like 20 inches of rain overnight. Uh, uh, and later that morning, I had to walk to campus. I was just about a mile off campus in an apartment. Uh, and at one point, the water got close to the, my mid-chest trying to get to campus, just to give you a sense of how much water and how impacted a region that's it's a very populated region right next to the Rice's campus. Uh, so an extremely unbelievable event to the point where the only way you can really get around that morning was in canoe. Uh, again, this is one mile from campus in Rice Village, a very populated and popular area with many restaurants and bars. Um, $125 billion in damages, uh, 204,000 residences, 60%, uh, more than 60% of the people in Houston were affected from this uh, event in some way. Um, and Houston is the fourth largest city in the country. It, it, it really changed the, the city of Houston and the Gulf Coast forever, not just physically in some ways, but also mentally in terms of how we think about natural hazards. It, it has forever changed, uh, changed the city that I now call home. Uh, extremely devastating, devastating event. And then the 2010 Haiti earthquake, uh, which I was very involved, that was mentioned, as was mentioned earlier, uh, was a devastating event with roughly a quarter of a billion people, a quarter of a, a million people uh, perished in that event. Uh, many left homeless, and, and 10 years ago, this event occurred, and the nation is still recovering from, uh, from the damage that occurred here. And one of the things I've spent a lot of time doing after this earthquake was really trying to understand why this earthquake was so devastating and gave a lecture at Rice uh, just a few years ago about how you can't understand this earthquake in, unless you understand the history of Haiti and how the history of the country as the first freed black nation uh, was so fundamentally tied to what happened over 200 years later when Haiti, Haiti liberated themselves in 1804 and really the, the seeds were planted that day in terms of what happened 200 years later. So the importance of us understanding history uh, in terms of understanding uh, natural disasters is absolutely critical, and I'll, and I'll touch on that a little bit more uh, later in my comments. So if we look at uh, global natural disasters over the past roughly, I guess this is 50 years, we see the trend is not working in our favor. Uh, the impacts are increasing, uh, despite all the efforts that we've made and people in this community have made, despite all the funding we've put in, uh, the, the impacts of natural disasters continue to get worse and worse over the, over the decades. Uh, while we look at other fields where things seem to be improving, you know, we've made great strides with cancer and many other areas, we still are struggling to figure out how we can reduce the impacts of, of these uh, increasing natural hazards and disasters that are occurring uh, around the world. I, would, I often say that uh, resilience is the challenge of today's society. Um, it is the most pressing issue that we have to deal with as a society, and we need to figure out how we get this right and reduce that trend of the increasing impacts of natural disasters occurring around the world. And there have been many studies and many reports, and, and again, uh, you are on the front lines, and I appreciate all the great research and hard work that this community is doing to try to uh, make things better in this space. One of the reasons that it's such a challenging problem is because the risk and the impacts are evolving. They're changing. And some of the ways that they're changing are mentioned here. We have a, a growing and aging population around the country, so we have more vulnerable people uh, in, right in, at, at the forefront of where these uh, natural disasters are occurring. Um, we know, we, many of you have seen the various ASCE reports, that we have aging infrastructure all over the country. That makes it much more difficult. Uh, to manage and survive through these uh, major events. Uh, we have economic considerations. The connectivity between these infrastructures makes them more impactful when there's a natural disaster economically and socially. We're seeing a major population shift to the coast occur in the Gulf Coast and other coastal regions around the country. Increases in droughts and fires, uh, increased precipitation, occurring, uh, and certainly we know that we are having uh, sea level rise and climate change impacts, uh, partic particularly in certain coastal regions around, around the world. I think no place are, uh, can you see this more than on the Gulf Coast. Uh, again, uh, because I live in the Gulf Coast now, it's very uh, relevant to, uh, to me, and I, I see it every day. 
Uh, we're seeing the impacts of climate change and natural hazards and the involving risk uh, to our nation because of what's happening uh, in parts of the country. If you look at losses from uh, natural disasters, again, in the past 20 years, you see the vast majority of those losses are occurring in the coastal regions, the vast majority of that occurring in the Gulf Coast regions of, of uh, Texas, Louisiana, uh, and Florida. It's a very, very significant amount of, of loss in these regions. If we were to look at uh, it in another way in terms of the actual disaster damage per household, again, very significant, three of the top 10, are in uh, the Gulf Coast, Texas, Louisiana, and Florida, and make up the vast majority of, of losses that occur um, uh, to natural disasters. Yet this is an area where we're in seeing increases in population. And so you have increases in natural hazards, climate, climate change impacts, but yet uh, more and more people are moving uh, to this region, making, making matters obviously much more challenging to mitigate. And this is a region where the impacts, what happens in the Gulf Coast will absolutely impact each one of you in terms of, of shipping. So the Port of New Orleans is uh, number one, for example, in overall tonnage uh, with products worth over 52 billion. Um, and it's an end port for grain and steel that come down from the Mississippi. So you can imagine the supply chain impacts when we have storms in the Gulf Coast, particularly in the New Orleans area. The Port of Houston is the biggest in the Gulf with 69% uh, of the container traffic. It's the number one U.S. port in uh, total for uh, foreign uh, tonnage. Um, so it's extremely important uh, port, yet we know it's sitting right in, uh, at the bullseye for, for hurricanes and, and other uh, hazards. And we know the Gulf of Mexico provides roughly half of the total U.S. petroleum refining capacity and half of the natural gas processing capacity and we know Texas alone produces 70% of the plastics in the petrochemical industry. So you can imagine when this region is impacted, we will all feel the impacts of this all around, around the country. So what's the opportunity ahead of us? Uh, as many of us are educators in this area, uh, we, I've, we all know that research and education and outreach is what will get us uh, ahead of this challenge and, and help us to resolve this challenge. One of the things that I've uh, been preaching is the importance of taking advantage of the advances in many other fields uh, that, are, uh, um, that are out there for natural hazard mitigation. Uh, one of those fields is advances in new materials. If you think about the role of new materials in nearly every field, it's absolutely critical. It's transforming, whether it's microprocessors, materials are really the foundation for transforming technology. And I think that's also the case for, for our field, uh, for this field, in terms of uh, new high-performance materials, uh, carbon-reinforced concrete, carbon composites, self-healing materials. I know some of you do work in this area porous materials. I think what's the most exciting field from the materials perspective, we recently got a, a, a big gift at Rice for $100 million to create an advanced uh, materials institute, mostly focused on materials for energy transition. Um, but what's exciting about it is, is the way that materials research is changing. Materials are now being designed using AI and machine learning from the bottom up, where you can specify the properties of materials that you want and get those properties through uh, computational design. And I think in the next 10 years, you're gonna see an entirely new class of exciting materials for a variety of applications, and certainly some of them can be used uh, in, in, in natural hazard mitigation. And clearly, uh, data science and AI is just rapidly changing nearly every industry, every field of study, including our own, for sure. Um, and I've seen it, uh, probably the field that it's most uh, uh, um, obvious that's changing because of AI is the healthcare field. Um, so Rice is across the street from the Texas Medical Center, the largest medical center in the world. And we are constantly being approached by uh, the leadership and clinicians there uh, to work with them, uh, to, for our computer scientists to work with them. And we're seeing just rapidly how healthcare and, and decisions that are being made by doctors and clinicians are really guided by data, um, by the tons and tons of data that come through over the last two generations will be what uh, clinicians use to diagnose, 
to treat diseases, and it's rapidly changing the field, and I, I predict it will change many, many fields over the coming decades as these tools become more relevant and prevalent in, in our society. And we're seeing that certainly in, in our field, uh, whether it's ha uh, hazard forecast, structural control, uh, damage detection and health monitoring, uh, hazard analysis, uh, vulnerability ass assessment, as well as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, materials design and optimization will all be impacted uh, by the use of, of data science and AI and machine learning and deep learning will all impact that. And we are seeing, uh, we are seeing some increasing trends in a positive way. If you look at the lower left, uh, you see here the number of publications in different disciplines related to disaster mitigation and disaster preparedness and response and recovery, and you are seeing really a, a, a sharp increase in the past uh, decade or so in the number of, of, of papers and research that's using those tools to impact the way we do our work. So I hope, I hope this continues to increase. I hope this goes in order of magnitude higher because I do believe this is a tool that has the opportunity to really change, change the landscape and give us a, a, a better understanding of how we can handle and, and mitigate some of these, uh, some of these disasters. And we need to educate the whole student. Um, if you looked at the title of my slide, I talked about equity and, and, and resilience, and you really can't separate the two of them. Um, increasingly, you're seeing these natural disasters impact uh, disadvantaged communities much more than they do with affluent communities. And, and the paper on the right is actually from a socio sociologist uh, at Rice who studied the impact of, of Hurricane Harvey on different communities in, in Houston, and it was clear that uh, the more affluent communities fared much better for a variety of reasons than the middle class, and the middle class fared better certainly than, than the lower class, or the poorer communities. And we're seeing that uh, time and time again, independent of the hazard, uh, we're seeing how disadvantaged communities are just impacted so much more. And so we really can't separate resilience from equity when we think about resilience. And I challenge this community to make sure you consider both of those together uh, because you can't have a resilient community if uh, different parts of the community are not benefiting uh, similarly from, uh, from the benefits that we develop in terms of the tools that we develop as a society. And we have to partner with uh, our local and state, and in some cases, national communities uh, as much as we can. Again, for us in, in the city of Houston, um, what happens in Houston impacts the university. What happens at the university, we feel, impacts the city of Houston. So we've, we've really worked hard to work closely with the city. We have a, a, a center at Rice that really uh, uh, helps the city significantly in terms of real-time monitoring of of flooding uh, at the local level um, and really helps the city develop tools, not only the city, but also local industries, particularly the Texas Medical Center uses some of the data that we develop at Rice to help them figure out uh, what's happening around storms. And so I think it's absolutely important to partner with your city. We find that it makes our research stronger and certainly much more impactful when you have the right partnerships with your local uh, and state communities. And we have to make sure that we provide our students with the opportunities to translate uh, their research. I think you're, you often hear now the, the sort of the buzzword of innovation and entrepreneurship and uh, tech transfer, and sometimes we feel that that's not something that we do in this community. But I do think there are some significant opportunities uh, for the researchers in this space uh, to also work in, uh, in the space of, of innovation and entrepreneurship and developing technologies that can actually be commercialized uh, that are tools that can be used um, um, to, to help uh, communities uh, deal with natural hazards. And it will uh, also help us attract uh, this generation of students who many of them want to work in this space and they don't think that our community provides those opportunities, but uh, they absolutely, they absolutely do. And the role of the universities, as was mentioned earlier, uh, well, we need to make sure that we continue to uh, prepare a diverse workforce because um, they are the future. They are the ones that will be impacted uh, by this the most, and we need to engage a very diverse group of researchers in helping to come up with the solutions that we need 10 and 20 years from now 
to solve these problems. And there are many programs out there, including the Gulf Scholars Program, which is funded by the Gulf Research Program of the National Academies, is a great example of a program that's really geared towards bringing in diverse uh, students at the undergraduate level right now focused on the Gulf Coast to engage them in this, in this problem and, and bring, them to, bring this problem to light and, and uh, have them work directly in their communities to help resolve some of these issues. So let me end with a call to action. I think we have an incredible community here. This, uh, the Neary community is, is fabulous and incredible facilities, great researchers, uh, a great group that can carry the flag forward in terms of what we need to do uh, to really uh, turn things around and, and to begin to solve this very, very pressing problem. Um, just uh, 60 years ago, uh, President Kennedy, uh, we just celebrated his 60 years of the speech that he made, which he happened to make at Rice University in our football stadium uh, 60 years ago, September 12th, so we had a really nice celebration. Unfortunately, it was 95 degrees, and I was sitting in the sun for two hours. It was quite miserable, but evidently it was even hotter that day 60 years ago. But it was that day that he said that we will put a man on the moon, and, and we did. Within a decade, we put a man on the moon. And so uh, when we put our minds to it, there's really nothing that we can do. And there have been other similar programs to the Moonshot program, uh, including the Sunshot program shown in the, in the lower left, which was a program from the DOE that was funded about a decade ago to bring the cost down. A colleague of mine, who's currently my VPR, ran that program to bring the cost down of solar from you know, 52 cents and, and with the goal of getting it down to five cents by 2030, and now they're at around 10 cents per, per kilowatt hour. And so again, significant resources were put in that program, but when we put our mind to it and we put our resources to it, there's really nothing that we can't do as a nation. And most recently you saw President Biden announce a cancer moonshot to really completely eradicate cancer. And I believe it will happen. I believe as a nation, when we put our will to it, when we put our will to doing something, when we put the resources uh, to doing something, we can, we can really solve any problem that's ahead of us. And I'm hoping that uh, this community can make the case for a res resilience shot. We wanna see that curve, we wanna see the numbers go down, we wanna see the impact of natural hazards not continue to go up, but go actually go down. And I believe with the bright minds we have here, uh, the bright minds you have in your students, uh, and with resources, uh, we can make, we can turn this trend around and begin to see uh, natural hazards impact our communities less and less moving forward. So, um, my closing remarks are really just a summary of, of um, what I've mentioned today. It, it, I think this is the challenge of our generation, uh, building resilient, sustainable, and again, equitable, you can't tie, you can't just talk about resilience without talking about equity. Uh, I think there are a number of emerging tools that would provide us with the opportunities to really begin to understand this problem and mitigate this problem much better. And we have to educate our students to look at these things, not just from an engineering and science perspective, but also uh, a humanistic social sciences and a business perspective uh, as much as possible. And I do think we have the opportunity for our own moonshot within this community to solve this problem. Thank you.